to let you all know that there are plenty of soup and sandwiches still back there. Give me one second. Uh, my name is Megan Gaynor. I'm the vice president of the board this year for the chamber, and I'm here to introduce our program. And we've got Jerry Mays with us from Pillar Financial Group, who is going to come up and teach us all how to be millionaires. So we're going to be eternally grateful. So that's some big shoes for you. <laughs> Chase. <laughs> all right. Welcome. I'm not going to use this unless you all tell me I'm not talking loud enough, okay? Um, my name is Jerry Mays, and I have an independent uh, financial advisory, investment advisory business in Beaver Dam called Pillar Financial Group. Uh, the name is intended to be a dedication, so to speak, to be a pillar in the community. And uh, we hope that we are accomplishing that with uh, giving good sound advice and, and, uh, and, and doing it in, in my thinking uh, in what's your, uh, your best interest. There's, there's a rule out there, and some of you probably have heard some of the commercials, that it's called a fiduciary rule. And the fiduciary rule means I, as an advisor, have to act in your best interest. Should that really be a rule? I mean, especially the hospital people here, do you, are you automatically going to act in their best interest? Sure you are. So we automatically are going to act in our client's best interest. We don't need a rule to tell us to do that. So we feel like that's what we're doing. Uh, at Pillar, so we, we feel like we've already accomplished what the rule is trying to get. Uh, our broker dealer is a company called Money Concepts Capital. Every company has to have what's called a broker dealer. Popular broker dealers are Edward Jones, uh, Merrill Lynch, here in Lyons used to be around and Baird bought them out. So those are broker dealers. LPL is a broker dealer. Uh, I started in the financial world at 22 years old. So it's been a while, 39 years I've been in this, been in this uh, financial world. I've been working in the investment world for the last 30 years. 1981 graduate of Ohio County High School, 1985 graduate of Western Kentucky <coughs> with a bachelor's in accounting. So one of the things that I bring different than most financial advisors is I have a tax background. I have an accounting background. So when we meet with clients and we discuss their investment options and things like that, we're also thinking about what their taxes may be. So it's not just about being an order taker, you telling me this is what you want to accomplish and I say, okay, sign here. It's we got to figure out what the taxes are going to be at the time you're starting to take it out or at the time uh, these accounts progress during the year. So it's, it's, it's more than what you normally will get because I've heard other stories of other broker dealers saying that their advisors will say, well, what the client may say, what about taxes? And they'll go, oh, we can't give tax advice. You got to talk to your tax preparer. Well, I think that's a cop out. If I know the answer, I'm going to help you. So keep that in mind. All right, let's start with a couple of stories. Yeah, and, and I know Chuck, blank Chuck, but this doesn't go well because he wanted me to. Anyway, uh, wealth management and markets and all that kind of stuff. But uh, we're gonna we're gonna do more. We're gonna do less wealth management, and and I'll talk to Chuck on the side for his classic cars. But uh, we're gonna do more investing in the economy, and we've got an election coming. So. Uh, but let's start with a couple of stories. I, I tell this story often, so I apologize if, if you've heard it. Those of you at AARP last month, it's going to be the same story. So, uh, Sometime in the late 70s, the chamber was meeting at Sheffield's restaurant. Show of hands, who, remember, who, who went to a chamber meeting at Sheffield's? All right, very good. You just aged yourself there. Uh, Late in the 70s, they had a guest speaker 
much like what you've got today, stock market guy. The Dow Jones was at 825 at the time, 825. He told the crowd that in 10 years, the Dow Jones would be at 2,000. So the crowd dispersed, they're out in the parking lot. My dad's telling me this story years ago. He said they all thought this dude was crazy. There's no way the stock market's going to 2,000. It didn't matter 10 years or 20 years. It's not going to 2,000. Well, 10 years later, the Dow Jones was at 2,168. So it sounded crazy at the time, but it happened. And it happened a lot of times, what we talk about in our office is a thing called the Rule of 72. The Rule of 72 says this. If you take the number 72, divide into it your rate of return, the answer that you get is the number of years it will take to double your money. So we take 72, the stock market average on the entire history of the stock market is 9%. I think it's a little bit higher than 9%, but we're gonna use 9% for this example. Nine into 72 goes eight times. So our money should double every eight years. So that's kind of the thought process that we use in our office. Now, it's not automatic. You're not gonna get 9% every year and all those kinds of things. But in general, if we can average that, we can double our money every eight years. And then you start doubling your money on a bigger number. So it takes us to story number two. The summer of 2016, I'm waiting for my food at Dairy Queen inside. I'm not a drive thru kind of guy, I go inside. Uh, it's Trump versus Hillary. Everybody remembers 2016. The Dow Jones is now at 16,500. I got asked while I'm sitting there waiting for my food, what do I think the market will be doing going forward? Of course, at that time, we all thought Hillary was gonna win, but again, I quote the rule of 72, explained it to this gentleman, just like I just explained it to you. I said, with that being said, I think in eight years, the Dow Jones will be at 33,000. That's the year 2024. I said, I thought it would be at 33,000. This guy takes a step at me. I'm sitting down, I think he's gonna hit me. <laughs> he said, is that what you're telling your clients? I go, yeah. I said, it's the rule of 72. I just, I'm not telling you it's gonna happen. It's gonna be somewhere in the neighborhood close. It's the rule of 72. So he gets mad and leaves. By the way, I guess I was wrong. Because eight years later, the Dow's at 42,000. I missed it by 9,000 points. I see that guy every now and then. He doesn't really look my way much. But, but that's, that's the thought process here is that gentleman couldn't believe that 16,500 could turn into 33,000. That was a huge number. It's a huge number. I'm gonna throw another huge number at you. If it's 42,000 right now, in eight years, 84,000? It's hard to wrap our heads around that, but that's the rule of 72. So, anyway. So as an advisor, I believe the S&P is, is, is a, the S&P 500, I believe, is a more important index. And, and the Dow Jones, those of you that don't know, the Dow Jones, when I'm out on the street, somebody says, what's the stock market doing? They really want to know what the Dow's doing. It's 42,000, it's 43,000. When I get in my office and I turn the TV on, I want to know what the S&P 500 is doing. The Dow Jones is 30 stocks. The S&P 500 is 500 stocks. So we get a more well-rounded, how's the market doing when we know what the S&P 500 is doing. So that's, that's the only one I care, care about. So currently we're, on, uh, we're in the middle of a two year, uh, or for the last two years, the current bull market is, is up 63% since October of 2022. That was the bottom of the 2022. We lost 20% in 2022. The S&P went up 23% in 2023, and it's up about 22, 21, 22% in uh, 2024. The average bull market lasts four years. 
And the average return to that four years is 110%. So we still have move, uh, room to, to move. And, and the strange thing about this bull market is most of it is made up of seven stocks. The Magnificent Seven. Some of you may have heard about the Magnificent Seven. Uh, Chase already mentioned NVIDIA. NVIDIA is the number one crazy artificial intelligence stock that's feeding all the other six Magnificent Seven stocks. So in 2023, the market was up 23%. It was almost entirely made up of those seven stocks. So the other 493 did very little. So now those 493 are starting to get in the game a little bit, but those seven stocks are still leading the way. NVIDIA is the number one artificial intelligence stock. Show of hands, who remembers war games in the mid 80s with Matthew Broderick? Yeah, there's a few older ones. War games was about, in general, they were playing a game. And the computers were playing this game and it, was, it, it ended up being that Russia had their finger on the nuclear bombs and the United States had their finger on the nuclear bombs because one thought the other was going to set the bombs off. And it was a game. And, but neither computer knew it was a game. So they almost launch them until Matthew Broderick and I can't remember the other character said, don't do it. The computer says it's a game. That's what artificial intelligence is going to do to us if we don't make sure that they know that they can't do this. It's, it's, a, it's unbelievable what, what these robots and computers can do with artificial intelligence. I don't know if any of you have even noticed it or not, but if you Google something on your phone, or you do it on your computer or something, the first thing that pops up is AI powered. They're already doing everything for us. And artificial intelligence, in my opinion, is going to be the reason why the stock market keeps going up. Remember, the stock market is about companies making money. And when you invest in these companies, and a lot of times we do it with mutual funds, mutual funds is a basket of stocks. If I put a basket right here, and we started throwing stocks into that basket, uh, NVIDIA, McDonald's, Walmart, uh, Amazon, whatever you want to do. That basket gets full, that basket's a mutual fund. So you're investing in mutual funds, whether it's your retirement plan or just individual investing, and those mutual funds are making that 23% a year or whatever that what, what we made last year and what we're up 21 or so this year. So, if these companies are making money, you're going to benefit. Artificial intelligence is bringing down the expense of the employees that, remember, we've got a $2 million shortage of people that want to work. We hear that all the time. Artificial intelligence is taking their place. And they don't eat, they don't need benefits, they don't get paid. So they're, they're benefiting that company and that company is going to make more money and more money, and the value of that company is going to go up. And you're invested in that company because you're in that mutual fund. That's why you're going to continue, your 401ks and all that stuff is going to continue to get bigger and better. So, in my mind, artificial intelligence is the silver bullet behind, that's a Lone Ranger reference for you young folks. Um, it's going to be behind the thought process that maybe we don't need to fill those two million jobs now that we're missing. And again, they're going to do it in a more efficient way. Okay. By the way, raise your hand if you've got a question at any point here. I know that Shannon over here is worried about my five pages of notes. Um, additionally, again, to help, to help the stock market returns uh, is the Fed cutting rates. Uh, some of you may know that on September the 18th, the Fed cut it a half a point, the Fed funds rate. I didn't think they'd go a half, but they did. So when that happens, the Fed fund rate, and that's, that's going to, that's going to, the consumer borrowing money, that Fed fund rate is what you're going to be looking for. 
So right now that Fed funds rate is an average of about, of about 4.83%. And they are set, to, the Fed's set to meet again on November the 7th, which is after the election, and December the 18th. And if they start cutting rates, we're gonna be in a, in a situation to where they're cutting rates and we're not in a recession. Some people might say we're in a recession, but we're not. We may get into one by the end of 2025, but we're not now. So when, they, when the Fed cuts rates, while we're not in a recession, it's almost a guarantee that the market goes up. At least history tells us that. So five of the last 10 best bull markets was in an environment when the Fed cut rates in a strong economy. So that's what we've got going right now. Now, are they going to continue to cut rates? I'm starting to doubt it. Uh, I, I thought before that they would cut two more times in November and December. It's still probably going to happen, but they may only cut once. We get into 2025, I thought they'd cut five, six, seven times. I think they may only cut two or three times because I think inflation is going to be sticky. Who still sees when they go to the grocery that it seems to still keep going up? And I think that's what we're going to get, and I think the Fed is going to recognize that maybe inflation is not going to go down as quick as we've once thought. When we get into other things that are signaling that, that inflation may not be going away very quick, is, is sometimes is treasury bonds. And we've got the 10-year treasury. Bankers in the room know that in, in a lot of cases, the 10-year treasury is what dictates what loan rates are going to be. And give you an example, when the Fed cut in September a half a point, the 10-year treasury was 3.64%. Today, the 10-year treasury, after a half point cut, the 10-year treasury is now 4.2. So that tells you that rates are trying to go back up, at least on the loan side. So if that happens, inflation is not done. So just be aware of that when it comes to the economy and all that kind of stuff. All right, moving along. Uh, let's see here. Inflation, the, the other part of inflation I'm worried about is, again, if AI, artificial intelligence, is going to help the job market, it also can tighten the job market. If we've got, if we've got all the best workers out there and we've got nobody else to take those best workers' place and AI has taken the place of the ones that don't want to work, then these guys that are good at what they do, they're going to be in high demand. And if they, go to another, if they go to another company, they're going to go for a higher wage. If they go for a higher wage, whatever trinket that that company is making is going to be a higher cost. If that's a higher cost, you're, when you go to the store, you're going to pay higher for it. Therefore, that creates inflation. So it's, it's going to be, it, 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 I still believe we're going to have inflation in 25 and 26 and it's going to keep us from rates coming down the way we want them to come down. And it, and it can be artificial intelligence is going to help us on one side. They may make it a little tougher on the other side. But how the election goes is going to also have issues with that. And again, I, I don't want to get into who's for who and who's for that. I kind of have an idea in general. Kentucky's going to go with Trump. I just think that's a guarantee, but, but we're, we're not going to get into that. But we are going to get into what it means on what president and what, how the Congress plays out and how it affects the stock market. Uh, first thing to understand, I think, and we lose, we can lose the thought process here can be wrong these candidates are not going to get everything that comes out of their mouth. I, I heard, I, I was on the radio with, with uh, Josh Wright not long ago, and he was telling me that uh, at Hardee's, at the uh, table of knowledge, <laughs> and, and, and I interrupted him and said, you mean the table of useless knowledge, but, but anyway, 
He said they were all been out of shape over uh, Kamala Harris's comments about unrealized capital gains and, and how their house that's they bought years ago at 100,000 is now worth 200,000 and they're going to have to pay. There's no way that's going to happen. Uh, so some of the things that come out of these candidates' mouths, they're just, they're, they're pie in the sky type stuff. For, so don't, don't get too worried no matter who wins, what they said they're going to do, that they're going to do, because most of the time it doesn't happen. Um, and, and that's one that I just don't see how in the world you can tax something that has not yet been recognized. Uh, if you're going to do that, if you're going to, for example, if you're going to tax me because I bought something in the stock market at $10 and it went to $20, and I've, I've got a hundred, I've doubled my money, and you're going to tax me on that double, when that market goes the other way, you've got to give me some of that back. And there's no way they're going to do that. So it, it, just, it just cannot happen. I mean, there may, be, there may be a way they come up with, and I think one of the things that they're really harping on is some of the billionaires are not selling their stock because it would create a, a capital gains tax, so they're borrowing money against it. And if they borrow money against it, then they're only paying a loan rate. Maybe it's five, six, seven percent, and that's a whole lot less than the capital gains tax. Maybe you try to do something in that arena. I get that, because they're doing it for no other reason than to avoid the, the tax. But that, that, that's, that's probably another something that will never be solved again. Keep in mind, uh, can you really put a thumb on the things they're doing anyway? They're not doing anything. And here's a classic example. The stock market loves gridlock. So in my world, and when we sit down with a client and, and they're going back and forth, I can't figure out who to vote for and all this kind of stuff. And I usually say, look, if you can't figure out who to vote for, vote the way it's going to affect you. And, and right now, the way it's going to affect them is income taxes. Uh, Trump's tax cuts in 2016 expired December 31 of 2025. That means, if those of you that don't remember, uh, you know, you got 10% or lower, and then the first, the first uh, bracket or the first uh, percentage was 15%. 15 went down to 12 when Trump signed in the, that tax cut. So on January 1 of 2016, if Trump does not win, I'm assuming if Trump wins, he'll extend it. If Trump does not win, that 12% income tax is going to 15. So that's an immediate 3% increase. If you're in the 22% tax bracket, you're going to 25. If you're in the... Uh, 32, no, if you're in the 24% tax bracket, you're going to 32. And if you're in the 32, I think you're going to 39. So that's a guarantee, unless something strange really happens if, if Harris were to win. But here's another thing that's not being talked about that everybody in this room needs to be concerned about, is the business owners are getting a 20% basically discount or a 20% uh, relief on your, on your income. So if, you're, if your company, if your business makes $100,000 and you're doing your taxes, you get to take the first 20,000 off. You don't have to pay tax on $100,000, you're only paying tax on 80. That goes away too. So every small business that's making all these, you know, making it, uh, their dream and they're doing what they're always wanted to do and 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 Kamala saying we're going to change we're going to do away with Trump's tax cuts you're going to do away with that 20 percent that you've been getting off the top and that's I know personally that's going to I ain't going to like it all right let's talk about what can happen or what's happened in the past uh, when we had basically a Democratic president or a Republican president. Show of hands, who thinks the stock market is, all, is, is, is better, has a higher percentage with a Republican president in office? 
free. I'm not going to call you out or anything. Not very many. Who believes we, the stock market performs better with a Democratic president? About the same number, two or three. Well, the Democratic president and a Republican Congress, either the House or the Senate, gets 15.7% a year average since 1933. So a Democratic president in the last 40 years, we've had, actually had 20 years of a Democratic president, 20 years of a Republican president. In the last 40 years, the Democratic president has had 18 out of 20 up years in the stock market. Republican president had 15 out of 20 in the last 40 years. Now, there's a lot of circumstances that go into that. I'm not just saying it happened because of this and that. But that's pretty good evidence. I know four years ago when, and I always have to be careful how I word this, when Biden was our president, I used to say when Biden won the election and they would come across my, my conference room table at me. Biden didn't win. But anyway, uh, when, when Biden was our president or got elected, see, I use that word again. Uh, when Biden became president on January 20th of 2001, I had them nearly wrapped around my building to get in to see me. They were scared to death. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? And, and, and I've got a, I'm not going to talk about product or solution. I promise I won't do that. But I've got something that kind of satisfied them because I said, look, I think the stock market's going up. And I tried to prove it, and they're sitting over there going, I don't believe it. So I said, I think the stock market's going up, but if I'm wrong, I got something over here that will take care of you. But if, you're, if you think that it's not going up and you don't believe anything I'm saying, then your only alternative is to go across the street or go up the street or whatever and go to a bank. And so I convinced almost all of them that that was the right strategy was to stay with me and the results were been, have been tremendous. But I'm just saying what, what history tells us. And again, we'll just go through this. Uh, Democratic president and the Congress divided at 15.7% a year. Republican president and the Congress divided, still almost as good, 14.8% per year. A Democratic president and a Democratic Congress. That's, what, that's the one thing that worries me. 9% a year. Republican president, Republican Congress, 10.9% a year. A Democratic president, Republican Congress, 13% a year. And then the worst scenario that we could have is a Republican president and a Democratic Congress. That's 4.9% a year. So, what we need to hope for, I'm not going to say it, <laughs> is a Harris victory. I see you, CC. <laughs> and, uh, and Congress divided. I do think that the Republicans will win the Senate. I'm going to be close, but I think they'll get 51. I think the House is a toss-up. And I've kind of changed in the last two weeks. I thought Harris was going to win. I still Now I'm starting to think that Trump, Trump is probably going to win. Questions? <laughs> I skipped about, about half of it, Shannon. Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, anybody got a question, thought? I, I didn't, uh, let me end with this and then I'll, what's that? How much have we bet on your prediction? Well, the number one thing that you always hear about is what the economist, you know, there's always an economist review or econ economist telling you this and that. They're never right. So I'm going to lay my I'm going to lay my hat on the fact that I just gave you an economic thought process, and if I'm not right, I'm just like everybody else. Uh, I will say let, let let me give you one final thing to think about when it comes to the stock market and history. 
the last 50 years, the S&P 500 uh, average, S&P 500 index average, in the last 50 years is 11.87% a year. The last 30 years, 10.73% a year. The last 20 years, 10.47% a year. The last 10 years, 12.86% per year. And the last five years, 14.87% a year. That's better than the rule of 72 of 9%. So if you had 12% a year, your money doubles every six years. Rule of 72, if you remember nothing else, see that can't be wrong, so. I'll, be, I'll hang around in case anybody wants to ask anything. Thank you, Jerry. We appreciate your insight. Uh, and hope you will stick around because I'm sure you'll have some questions. So we're going to go ahead and uh, do the door prize, uh, which is from Commonwealth Community Bank. So I'm going to draw a ticket out and see who wins. The number is 888016. Zero one six. No, no takers. Okay, eight eight seven nine five nine. Miss Jolene Johnson. Everybody, give her give her a hand. Brittany Hill will give you your, your door prize. And I, I'd like to welcome Les and Jolene. I forgot to when, in the opening, but we're glad to see you all here today. And congratulations. By the way, we did meet at Sheffield. And most of the time I said, Mary Duval. <laughs> 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 You're still young, Les. You're still young. Um, so I wanted to, to mention that the annual awards, uh, we're gearing up for that. Uh, so, you know, the gala committee has been planning that for some time now. Uh, so the gala will be December 12th, so everybody be sure and mark your calendars. Our next meeting will be November 19th, that's on a Tuesday. We, we had to change that date with Thanksgiving. And we are really excited for that meeting. Uh, Corey Brown uh, will be discussing her, her business, uh, which is out on Highway 69. And we'll also have Tyson and Laura Sandifer to talk about the current state of agriculture. And I've talked to Tyson about it, and we're, we're really looking forward to having all three of them speak. So I think it's going to be a really good meeting. I hope you'll all attend and, and, and let your friends know. Uh, and with that, I thank you all for coming. Uh, hope you will be at the next meeting. You all have a good day.